can hear me now? All good. Okay. Hey guys, my name is Tara Kroll. Um, I'm 15 years old, and over the past few months, I've been super into synthetic biology. And specifically, I've been looking at how you can gene edit bacteria to produce sustainable biofuels. So, I just want another show of hands. How many of you drove to the showcase today? Okay, keep your hand up if you put fuel in your car regularly. Okay, that's a significant number of you that are using car fuel on a regular basis. But what if I told you that every single person that still had their hand up was going to emit 4.6 metric tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere this year? Every single person. That's equivalent to about a rhinoceros of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere every year. You might be feeling pretty guilty about that because I don't know if you're anything like me, but I care about the environment, like save the planet. But what if I told you it's not all your fault? Gas drilling is a massive issue within the space of fuels. Gas drilling is a long and carbon intensive process that usually involves steps including turning the oil taken from the ground into car fuel and then transporting it to customers. During that initial process, it's very carbon intensive because the machines that you use to drill the oil actually use carbon dioxide because they're burning fuel. And then there's carbon dioxide that is drilled out of the ground because it's released from the ground. Overall, the initial stage is a lot of carbon. And then the middle stage, when you're like constantly processing that, it's also carbon intensive. And then in the end, you go and put that fuel into your car and burn it again. There's so much carbon dioxide being emitted in this process, but what if I told you that you could completely omit this entire process? What if you could turn corn and grass into biofuels? Get rid of the whole oil drilling and processing and transporting it to customers. What if you could just take this corn and grass, turn it into biofuels with bacteria? Okay, now you might be thinking like, hold up a second, like corn and grass to bacteria? What is in what is in corn and grass that can turn it into a biofuel? Well, actually, corn and grass has a material in them called lignocellulosic feedstock material. Well, it, it's a big word, I know. It's a little confusing. But lignocellulosic feedstock material is like biology speak for some materials that exist in the cell walls of plants, such as cell cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. These materials, when they're passed into these bacteria, the bacteria can eat them, break them down into sugars, and then they can take those sugars and turn that into the biofuels that we can use in replacement of our original fuel types in our cars. Okay, so you've all heard of nasty bacteria like E. coli causing some adverse effects like stomach cramps, vomiting, and diarrhea. So like, raise your hand if you know what E. coli is. Yeah, it's a pretty common problem here in Toronto because E. coli is actually in high numbers in our lakes and it causes all these nasty symptoms. And we generally don't really like that one strain that is not very good for our digestive systems. But that's only one strain. There are many helpful strains of E. coli that we can genetically engineer to turn those cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin into our ethanol. But you might be thinking, how? Well, the general process here, we're trying to get glucose which is sugar, and turn it into ethanol. And the main way that we do that is through something called metabolism. Bacteria actually have a way, like all organisms, that they can take food and turn it into something else. Here the aim is to take sugar from the corn and grass and turn it into a usable biofuel. So for taking that glucose and turning it into ethanol, we're obviously starting out with our glucose. Glucose is the food for the bacteria. Through some chemical reactions in that cell, we're going to use the process of glycolysis, which naturally exists within E. coli. Then through another process, it becomes these other compounds. If you're familiar with biology, you'll have heard of acetyl-CoA and formate. But after that, through a series of chemical reactions that occur within the natural E. coli bacterium, we'll get a bit of ethanol and some acetate. But here's the problem. If we want to turn glucose into ethanol, this natural process isn't actually as efficient as it could be. Because number one, the maximum amount of ethanol that we can get out of this reaction 